you. Thank you, everybody. Well, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me here. It's my honor to be talking to you uh, on a topic that's very close to home, and you'll see why. Well, almost we, everything we do now, uh, we do it online. Our communication is online. Our entertainment is provided to us by the internet and video games. Our, for most of us now, the smartphone is becoming a tool for us to be connected to the world, but it's also a tool to organize our daily life. You wonder why 50% of Americans sleep next to their iPhone, the new teddy bear, it's called. <laughs> but this uh, major change in our lifestyle, um, with, with a lot of questions are being raised regarding uh, this 24-7 technological diet and what it is doing to us. And as a matter of fact, what it is doing to our kids, because they seem to be spending a lot of time online. These are my two daughters, Nina in pink, she's seven years old, and Leila in white, she's four years old, uh, interacting with digital technology, with TV in the background. I was watching them for a while when I took this picture, I was watching how they are playing with their mom's iPhone, but then after a while, I had to ask them to stop. Please take a break and go play outside. At the time, <laughs> it seemed like they listened to daddy. They disbanded and disappeared. So I might actually understand my shock. <laughs> <clears throat> when I discovered Leila hiding in the toilet and playing with her forbidden toy, just like any addict. <laughs> and this is what brought this problem of kids' overexposure to digital media close to home. So, some kids actually exposed at even an earlier age. Here's a picture of a fetus calling to schedule <laughs> his delivery date, <laughs> negotiating where and how and how would the birthday look like. But more seriously, a 2010 study by the Kaiser Family Foundation showed that um, our kids, between the age of 8 and 18, spend an average of 11 hours around media. I let you imagine that all of it is for entertainment, not for learning. And this is happening at a time where their plastic, influential, very malleable brain is undergoing a massive developmental change. Remember, we used to think that we're born with a brain completely crystallized and set in stone and nothing can impact it. Well, we know now that the brain of the human keeps growing even after birth and through adolescence. You can see here in a longitudinal study that was conducted at the National Institute of Health that in this video on the uh, right side, you can see the color changing to the blue, which is a sign of maturation. That's actually a study that followed kids between the age, the same kids between the age of 5 and 20, and revealed that our brain continues to grow outside the womb. During this time, 60% of synaptic connections are being pruned. And so just like in a forest, paths that are used on a daily basis get more defined and strengthened. Paths that are not used get neglected. So it's an important aspect of it. And it is reasonable to speculate in this case that our kids today are mostly strengthening neural pathways that are associated with their daily interaction with digital media. And fortunately, as usual, the popular press <laughs> pushed this idea a little bit further to propose, very seriously, that this continuous exposure to digital technology is triggering a human brain evolutionary process, and seen since Neanderthal created or found the tools, and that this process is now making our kids stupid, a process that's making our kids lonely, and a process that's actually driving us to craziness, psychosis, and addiction. You're kidding me. So as a neuroscientist, and by now an extremely anxious father of three digital natives, I decided to find out whether these claims are true, and whether they are based on any scientific evidence. And for this, I decided to start a research project 
in which I would like to look at the publications that have concluded this. And believe me, it's the jungle out there. So I focus on peer review, neuroscience studies that have been published in professional journals. And while neuroscience cannot help us to understand everything, I think there are some issues in which we can find some insight. And the first claim I went on to check was that internet is rewiring our brain and making us stupid. Now, the first study that have actually looked at the effects of digital technology on human brain was conducted at UCLA and published under the title of Your Brain on Google. This study has done one thing. They have taken 12 subjects that were not very familiar with the internet to start with and scanned their brain while they are performing a Google search. You can see the pattern of brain activity in blue on the left panel. Then they asked those same subjects to go and spend one hour on the internet for the next five days before coming back for a rescan. And that you can see now their scan in red on the left side. And you can see that it's significantly different from where they started with the initial scan. The authors concluded, oh my God, that's OMG. The internet is rewiring our brain. And this phenomenon can happen in less than five hours. So you can imagine how scary this finding was to parents. 50% of American parents think it's a scary idea to think about something rewiring our brain. Rewiring our brain. That's scary. Well, what you should know here, that rewiring happens every day. When you hear a joke, your brain is rewired. When you learn how to do mental math, if you do the same study with subjects that are trained, you would see the same thing. You actually would see the same thing with subjects learning to play piano, or even just imagining themselves playing piano. So what I'm trying to say here is rewiring happens every day. Any event in our daily life needs to rewire our brain before we can acknowledge it, memorize it, and learn it. So there's nothing new. But the question that comes up here is, is the internet more effective than other environmental stimuli in rewiring our brain? Neuroscience says no. So what is the question then? If everything rewires our brain, and the internet does so, is that rewiring a good or a negative change? And while we might not know the answer to this question, because it requires longitudinal studies, there are actually some human experiments in progress that we can look at and have some insight of what to expect from the future. This experiment is going on in South Korea. South Korea is the most wired country on Earth. Kids grow up there playing with the Internet. Schools have incorporated the Internet in their curriculum and classroom, and they are using it on a daily basis. Here's an example of children completely emerge in the online life at an early age. Well, you will be pleased to know that South Korean kids consistently rank at the top of the world in science, math, and reading. So excuse me to ask a question. Who is the stupid? Next claim I looked at, it's very known, is that Facebook is making us lonely. Well, what we know about neuroscience is that a human brain can only handle a maximum of 150 friendship or meaningful relationship. Now, let's look at the statistics of Facebook. It looks from the numbers, it might seem like surprising, but the average friends for any Facebook user is about 130. That's already less than 150. They communicate consistently with only 50 of those. That seems to me within the realm of what our social brain can handle in terms of significant friendship. Neuroscience confirms this and says that this kind of online activities that support our existing friendship is positive, and it's very good for their self-esteem. In addition, their connectedness to each other, 3 billion users around the world, through all the digital media and social networking, well, they are helping create what we call now the global brain. Through their connectedness, they have created a global brain. You don't know the global brain? 
Remember last spring, this global brain brought down one of the bloodiest dictators in North Africa and the Middle East. This is the kind of brain we're going to need to collectively confront our collective problems, global problems, from global warming to other wars and things like that. So it seems to me that our kids are not that lonely, nor are they that shallow. So that was fixed. The next one I looked at, well, online gaming. That's a tricky topic, by the way, because online gaming depends on how we use it, just like anything else. For instance, people who tend to play aggressive video games tend to become more aggressive. But on the other hand, people who play with pro-social video games tends to gain more empathy, so it can go both ways. The video game, if it's well used, can promote visual processing and motor response skills. Actually, we can use it to train active memory and help reduce cognitive decline associated with aging. Not bad, but then careful. Online gaming is a very engaging activity, and some binge players tend to get hooked on it, which can become problematic, especially if it interferes with daily life. Well, although this is the case, addiction and addiction to online gaming has not been established as an official mental disorder and will not appear in the upcoming volume of the DSM-5, the reference book used by psychiatrists to diagnose mental disorders. The reason for that is that one can stop playing the games without suffering any physiological withdrawal, and like heroin, for instance. And it was compared to heroin. That's why I'm bringing this example. In any case, science supports guidelines that request some unplugging. The guidelines, as of today, provided by the Association, the American Association of Pediatrics. Is a maximum of two hours of entertainment-based screen, not including the time they are using the internet to learn. North Korea went a little bit even further. They contributed and collaborated with parents to establish a curfew on online use between midnight and 6 a.m. The point of this is to help the kids unplug. Helping them unplug will reduce problems with attention span, for instance. Can reduce problems with cognitive overload, and can provide them with what we call the downtime, that necessary time when they get bored, where they have to reflect on and integrate the knowledge that they learned that day. So, even though the main message here is that we need badly scientific study and mostly longitudinal scientific studies. To learn about the real impact of digital technology on our brain, but in the meantime, it is clear to me that digital technology is not the problem; it's the way we use it that counts in terms of impact. And for new problems, we can find some old solutions, just like parenting. So for me, the future does not look as grim for the Homo digitalis as it was claimed by the popular press. Provided we do our job as parents first, to allow and help our kids self-regulate their online usage by maybe getting involved in what they do and how they do it. And as we do that, we can teach them just the way we teach them how to cross the street: look right, look left, go on. You do it with them, you watch them do it, and then you leave them alone. Another thing that needs to happen. Is that educators need to incorporate digital technology in the classroom so they can engage those students better, and they can teach them and equip them with the skills needed for them to navigate in this world. And the point of this is that we can harness the positive without having to look at the negative. And I am happy to see that this has already happened in our schools. So it's a good news. And so. After 50 years or so of reading "Good Night Moon" to our kids, parents have now moved to a different thing: "Good Night iPad" <laughs> to accommodate this new world. 
whatever it takes. The point is that we would like our kids to be prepared for their bright digital future, not our past analog that is only nostalgia. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>